Hey guys, welcome back to Release the Craft and Priscilla here with another episode of StoryCraft. If you're new here, StoryCraft is a segment where I tell you a story and you watch me craft. And as always, I am always accepting uh, suggestions, recommendations, requests for future stories. Um, I am willing to tell the wide range of stories here, so if there's anything you would like to hear me tell on this segment, feel free to leave it in the comments below. If you're not new here, thanks for coming back. I appreciate your face. Um, how's the family? How's everything going? I hope it's great. So, we're gonna jump into this one, guys, because the story I have for you today is bananas, I think is the, the most succinct way to sum it up. And it's kind of a long one because there's so much dialogue. Luckily, a lot of it's the same, <laughs> so it's not that much dialogue, in essence. But, uh, before I begin, content warning, content warning, this one is, uh, wild and crazy, but also not nice to animals, and, yeah, just, you've been warned. Not a great start, but you're gonna see it gets better. So, <laughs> let's jump into it. Today I'm telling you guys the story of the youth who set out to learn what fear was, which is the longest, longest title unnecessarily long and uh just be aware i'm going to be using the words youth and boy interchangeably here um understand at the time of this story the uh boy in question is of a hard job working marrying age but we're gonna call him boy because <laughs> it makes no sense also confusingly most of the artwork shows him as a very young boy which is not true in any version of the story i've read so i don't know why but here we go in the way long ago, there was a widower who had two sons. The eldest son was practically perfect, while the younger was so stupid that people lamented what a burden he would be on his poor, poor father. Um, which is rude. <laughs> but the eldest son, being the perfect golden child, um, was responsible for basically carrying out all the tasks that his father required in the daylight right? So he went and did everything. He was perfect. He got great marks in school. Like he was just the top dog. Um, everybody was like so amazed by this boy, but he only helped out his dad in the daylight because at nighttime he was too afraid. So when his dad would be like, Hey, can you run this message for me? He'd be like, get the fool to do it because I, uh, shudder every time I go out after dark, which like you big cry baby. Okay. Um, and the youngest son didn't understand this. And it continued when they would hang out around the fireplace and the stories would start to edge towards a little bit spooky, a little bit ghosty. And the eldest son and other people around the fire would be like, oh, this makes me shudder. It's so scary. And this like completely confused our youngest boy here. And he was just like, I, I don't understand what it means to shudder. I don't know fear. And his dad was like, okay <laughs> know something else though because you're useless and this sentiment continued while the youngest boy continued to mull over what fear might be and his dad was like um <sighs> could you do something with yourself um his brother would continue to laugh at him and call him a fool and eventually the dad was like you need to learn something soon um because you're not gonna learn earn like a living wondering what uh, shuddering is and fear is and he was like actually I think that's what I would like to do um, now that I'm old enough to work and earn my own living I think I would like to learn to shudder and the dad was like that's useless so the dad goes down <laughs> around the town telling everybody like hey you won't guess what my stupid son said he wants to earn his living by learning to shudder and he goes all the way around the town till he meets the sexton who you guys, it took me a very long time to figure out that a sextant was like a religious person, like a religious leader, and not a sextant, which is a tool used by sailors for navigation. Um, I was really confused. I thought he was talking to like a, a personified live action sextant. Turns out it's a sextant with an O. <laughs> um, so he tells the sextant about it, and he's like, my boy is such a fool. He wants to earn his living by learning to shudder. And the sextant's like, send me that boy. Um, I'll teach him to shudder, and I'll get his head right. And the father has no issues with a member of the church asking for a young boy to be sent to his house, which, like, red flag, red flag, red flag. But fortunately for our hero, this sexton was on the level. So he gives him a job uh, working in the church, ringing the bell. And, um, you know, they put him up in a room 
He's there. He lives with the sexton and his wife. And, you know, every day he's ringing the bell when he's told to. And seems to, things seem to be going well. And one day the sexton decides to wake up the boy in the middle of the night, tell him he needs to go up and ring the bell. And then he runs off and, you know, races up the stairs so he can get ahead of the boy and wait for him to get there. So by the time the boy gets to the top of the tower to ring the bell in the belfry, I learned that word, um, what he sees across the way is this mysterious figure in white. And he can't really make out the features of this. He can just see that it's a big man dressed in white. And he's like, hey, um, who are you? Identify yourself. Or I'm going to fucking knock you down the stairs. And the sexton, who is the figure in white, you know, is laughing to himself because he's like, I'm going to scare this boy so good. Um, but he doesn't say anything. He just stands there, doesn't move, doesn't respond. And the boy's like, I'm going to give you one more chance. Who are you? If you don't identify yourself, I'm going to knock you down the stairs. And still no answer. So the boy asks a third time. And on the third time, when he receives no answer, he like runs full out right at the sexton, crashes into him and knocks him down 12 stairs. And then he rings the bell and goes back to sleep because that's all he was told to do. Um, after a couple of hours, the wife of the sexton is like chilling in the room and she's like, uh, my husband said he was going to get up and take the boy to the bell tower and then he never came back that's weird and suspicious so she goes to the boy's room asks him if he knows where her husband is um because he was supposed to go up to the belfry and come back down and the boy's like uh no idea <laughs> because i went up there i rang the bell and there's just this weird random dude up there who wouldn't answer me so i knocked him down the stairs and the wife is like yo what so she takes off running up to the belfry and she goes to the other door, looks down the stairs and there's her good for nothing husband, like spread out, eagle spread out on the floor. Um, he broke his leg in the fall, y'all. And she's like, this was the dumbest idea anyone has ever had. So she goes, she picks him up with like Herculean strength, lifts up her husband, carries him down the stairs, and then runs all the way across the village to go tell the boy's father, like, your fool of a boy has caused us a great misfortune and broken my husband's leg. So he needs to get out of our house and you need to figure out something to do with him. So the dad goes, he fetches up his son, brings him home, and he's like, I cannot believe that you continue to trouble me, even as a young man out here working you still cause me misfortune. You are so useless. And the boy's like, um, I feel like I didn't do anything wrong because he didn't identify himself. He should have just said something. I thought he was like a dangerous rogue and I was defending myself. But okay, I hear you. I should make my own way and stop bringing you shame. So in the morning, I will leave um, to set out to find out how to shudder and I'll make my own way. And the dad's like, thank fucking God, because can't stand your useless ass and he can't stand him so much that he gives him fifty dollars which is like in back then money like a million dollars now if we adjust for inflation a billion dollars in this economy um so i don't really think he actually had to work but you know like he sets out on this journey and as he's leaving, the dad says, here's this money. Um, do not come back. Uh, don't tell anybody where you came from if they ask and don't tell them who your father is because I'm absolutely embarrassed by how much of a fool you are. And the boy's like, that hurts, but okay, fair. Um, but you'll see, I'm going to learn how to shudder. And the dad's like, I literally don't care. Please get away from me. I have only one son and he is perfect. So the boy sets off down the road. Um, apparently not as hurt as one might be by being completely cut off by their father because all he does is mutter to himself if i could only learn to shudder whoa if i could learn to shudder um as he's walking and as he's walking down this path of course he's running into people they're probably avoiding him because he's just walking around talking to himself but this one man comes up from behind and he's listening to him and then he starts to join the boy like in his stride and they continue on in relatively amiable silence quote unquote silence because the boy has not stopped muttering about how he wishes to learn to shudder and after some distance of traveling with the boy the man's like hey the sun is setting if you look over there you'll see a tree that marks the site of a gallows and there's um a spot there where seven people have been hanged so if you sit underneath it uh after nightfall you'll learn how to shudder and the boy's like 
Fair. I'll do it. I'll try it. And if I learn to shudder, I'll give you my $50. So come back to me in the morning and I'll let you know if I shuddered. So the man's like, sweet, easy money. And he sets off to an inn and the boy goes all the way over to the gallows tree and he sits down underneath it. There are bodies hanging there, swaying in the breeze. He starts a fire, is completely unbothered and, you know, starts to chill. And then as the night gets darker, it gets colder and the fire just isn't warming like the fire should. So he tries to stoke it a little bit, um, but he's still getting colder and colder as the time goes on. And while he's sitting there, you know, starting to shiver, he looks up and he sees these seven men who are all hung up on the tree. And he's like, oh, if I'm cold, they're cold. Bring them inside. Um, so, you know, he decides to grab the ladder that was used to string them up initially, bring it over to the tree and bring down the bodies one by one and position them in a circle around the fire. Then he adds some more wood to the fire, making it larger. And he's like, all right, now everybody's going to be great. We're all going to warm up. It's going to be fantastic. Um, and turns out the, the men were dead, so they didn't warm up at all. In fact, they didn't move or speak or join in the conversation whatsoever. Um, they just started to burn because the fire at this point was so big that their clothes started to catch on fire. And he was like, hey, hey, take care or I'm going to hang you up the tree again. And the dead men just continued to be dead. So their raggedy ass clothes kept burning. And he was like, hey, if you can't be careful, I'm not going to burn with you. So you need to get up this tree. And the dead men said nothing. They just continued to burn. So the boy, having been fed up with their foolishness, decides to hang the, all the bodies back up into the tree. And then he just goes back to sleep. Like, no big deal. Like, he wasn't just handling a bunch of corpses or they were on fire or anything. So in the morning, the man comes around and he's thinking, I'm going to make a sweet, easy money. Like, this is going to be fantastic. And he's surprised to see the boy sleeping super peacefully underneath the corpses of the hanging tree. And... When he wakes the boy up, he's like, well, did you learn to shudder? Do you know what it is now? And the boy's like, no. How could I possibly know? These guys were so stupid, they never opened their mouths or stopped themselves from burning. And the man's like, I'm not getting paid, am I? And the boy's like, you're absolutely not. I didn't learn anything. And so the man leaves the boy and he's like, this was the strangest thing that's happened to me. I can't wait to tell this story when I get back to the pub. And the boy continues to pack up his things, set on his way, and just starts up his muttering mantra all over again whoa if i could only learn to shudder if i could but learn to shudder and eventually a messenger comes up on the path behind him listens to him repeat over and over and over that he wants to learn to shudder and the messenger's like boy come with me i have just the thing for you so the messenger takes the boy back to the king's like castle the castle of the king and there he tells the king hey this boy really would like to learn to shudder we have a problem i think maybe he could solve it or you know we could set him on that path and the king sort of looks the boy up and down he's like he's a pretty handsome looking young man okay let me tell you the situation here we have an old abandoned castle that is super haunted and if you want to learn to shudder that's the place to be um i'm offering Anybody who can stay in that castle for three nights and not die like everyone else who has um, the hand of my daughter and essentially the kingdom if you can, you know, stay in that castle for three nights. Um, also, you can have all the treasure that's inside because apparently there's lots of treasure in there. No one's ever found it. People just go in there and die. So if you want to learn to shudder, uh, you could try this. And the boy thinks about it and he's like, I'd like to actually try. The, the stakes don't seem that high. Everyone's died, you say? Not concerned. Um, so the king's like, all right, okay, I like your gumption. I like the cut of your jib. Um, you can ask me for three non-living things to take with you into the castle. And the boy thinks about it, and he's like, I would like a fire, a lathe, and a carving bench with a knife. Which is technically four things, but it's a set, okay? <laughs> so the king's like, no problem. Sends all that stuff to the castle and points out the direction to the youth. Tells him he will meet him in the morning, and the youth heads off. To the castle. Um, he starts the fire up and then he sits himself down next to the fire in one of the rooms there and uh, sits up at the turning lathe and he's just chilling and he looks around the room. It's empty and he goes, if I could only learn to shudder <laughs> to nobody uh, because this guy likes talking to himself. And um, he continues to mutter this as he chills out by the fire and plays around with the turning lathe. And uh, eventually he hears this loud shriek and then a couple of hisses. And these voices emerge from the darkest corner of the room and they say, oh, how cold we are. And the boy says, don't be fools. 
come over here and be by the fire. Warm yourself if you're cold. Don't just sit over there, you idiots. And they're like, out of the shadows, these two giant black cats come over. And, you know, they do cat stuff. They rub their heads on him. They're like, hey, what's up, guy? And they sit down next to him. And everything seems pretty peaceful. He's like, great. I have some companions to hang out with me by the fire. And... Eventually, you know, everyone seems to be getting along just fine. So the cats look at him and they say, how about a game of cards? Because they're the best cats ever. <laughs> they come out of the shadows, they talk, and they also play games. And the boy's like, I actually would really enjoy a round of cards. But first, you have to show me your paws. And, um, you know, the cats present said toe beans and he's like your claws are way too sharp to play cards so he seizes both the cats by the scruffs of their necks lays them on the carving bench secures their paws to it and at this point is the point where i realize that our boy isn't just a boy he's like an old god because there's no way he manages to wrangle two giant black cats without like godly intervention because that's impossible um, so the cats start yowling in protest, and the boy says that after watching you so far, I no longer wish to play cards with you. And without another word, he bonks them on the head, throws them out the window into the deep little pond that's, like, next to the window. Um, and, like, while the boy isn't wrong, these cats were definitely not to be trusted. Um, they literally hadn't done anything but complain about being cold, take a nap, and then offer to play a game. So I feel like this response was a little bit unwarranted. Granted, they are spirits of this castle, so they were probably up to shenanigans. Um, but then he sits down back by the fire, and just as he gets a little bit comfy, swarms of black cats and dogs. These dogs are trailing flaming chains behind them. They emerge from all the cracks in the walls, and they run around the room, absolutely running amok. They tear up the carpets, they tear up the rugs, they tear up the tapestries. Um, they stomp through the fire, scatter ash and like burning tinder everywhere. And caused this huge uproar. And the boy gets so frustrated that he grabs the knife from the carving bench and calls out, Be off, you rabble rousers. And some of them run away because they're a little bit intimidated. But other ones he has to, like, fight off and, you know, stab at. So there's a big warrior. I'm not going to go into detail because I don't, I don't really appreciate the animal violence, even if it is ghostly animal violence. And um, the ones that he does manage to get, he tosses out the window into the pond as well. And eventually... All of these, like, spirit animals, black shuck-type black cats are all gone. So he's like, well, that was an experience. But we've had it, and it's over, so I'm going to fix the fire up. And that's what he does. He rekindles the fire and then decides he's going to head over to the disheveled, probably super dusty, crusty, musty bed in the corner. And um, as he lays into the bed and starts to fall asleep, he hears a noise. The noise is the sound of the bed slowly stretching out the post of its legs and jerking a little bit as it's getting a little bit uh, frisky. Yes, that's right. The bed is moving. In fact, it's moving now at a speed as it's clipping around, jumping to life, hopping back and forth. And the boy's like, fantastic. If only you could go a little bit faster. And the bed's like, challenge accepted bitch so it takes off at a run all through the castle up and down the halls down the stairs you know through the courtyards around the palace everywhere it can go this bed has run a muck it is out of control it is absolutely wild so eventually the bed gets to the middle of the great hall is like i am fucking exhausted flips over onto its back trapping the boy underneath it and stops moving so the boy wriggles himself out from underneath the covers, which, like, I don't, I don't even understand how he got under those dusty covers anyways, but he managed to get under them and then stay under them this entire escapade. And, uh, you know, he kicks the mattress out from over him so he can squirm out of it. And when he gets up, he goes, well, now anyone who wants to drive can drive and goes back to the bedroom and just sleeps on the floor by the fire. No big deal. Running mattresses. We're not concerned. So in the morning, the king comes to check on the boy and he thinks he's dead because he just sees him lying on the ground. And he's like, what a pity to lose somebody so handsome. And the boy jumps up and goes, oh, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> and the king's like, what? Oh, plot twist. Um, and he asks the boy, how was the night? And the boy says, uh, well, it was pretty well. I didn't have a single problem. And I'm sure the next two will be just the same. Uh, but unfortunately, I didn't actually learn how to shudder. And the king's like, whoa. 
that's strange. Most people are dead by now. But hey, I'll come back tomorrow. See you in the morning. Have a great evening. So the boy does boy stuff for the rest of the day. And the night comes around again uh, pretty quickly. And he announces to the empty castle, Ah, if I could only learn to shudder. And he sits down by the fire. Um, at the stroke of midnight comes a soft noise, and the noise starts to get louder and louder and louder. And eventually the noise becomes a loud scream, like a, just a shrill, high-pitched scream. And half of a man falls down the chimney and lands on the floor in front of him, magically missing the fire, I guess. And upon seeing this, the boy gets up, and he goes over to the chimney, and he shouts up at, Hello up there! There's another half that belongs here! This isn't nearly enough. Because priorities. <laughs> And there's another noise that starts out as a low tone and then becomes a roaring scream once again as the bottom half of the man falls down to the ground. And the boy's like, good, excellent, good job, Chimney. And as he turns around, there, the bottom half of the man and the top half of the man have joined together. And it has stolen his seat. And this um, really sets off the boy because he's like, I was going to stoke the fire for you, but now you've stolen my spot. And that wasn't part of our deal. That bench belongs to me. And he completely misses that this boy, this like man is horrible looking. He's super ugly. He looks a little bit decayed. He's sitting there with an ugly, like, gappy grin as he's staring at him. And there's like maggots there. It's gross. And he's just like, you can't sit in my spot. Okay. <laughs> I didn't say that was okay. I'm trying to be nice here, but you stole my spot. And the man doesn't move. He doesn't even respond. So the boy's like, uh, yeah, you got to move. And the man still says nothing. So the boy just pushes him. He absolutely overpowers the man, shoves him off the bench, and resumes his own place at the little bench. And the man's like, oh, well, <laughs> says nothing, does nothing. There's no retaliation. But... Suddenly, a bunch of clattering sheets happen to come from the chimney again. And this time, seven other men fall down the chimney. Complete. The whole men this time. And these seven other men, they have brought with them two skulls and nine bones from the dead. And they set them up to play nine pins. So essentially, a bowling league of really gross, ugly men fell down the chimney. And the boy watches them and then announces that, hey, I would also like to play nine pins. And the grotesque men turn to him and they say, only if you have money. And the boy says, I have money enough, but you can't properly play with lopsided balls. So he takes the skulls and he turns them on the lathe until they're perfectly smooth, which like, I don't, I don't know how that works. I don't do wood shop. I definitely don't do bone shop, but it works here, okay? So once they're perfectly smooth, the boy jumps up and says, this ball's actually going to roll now. This is going to be a lot more fun. And then they proceed to have a rousing match of nine pins. And he loses a little bit of his money in the process. And then the clock strikes three o'clock and all the men disappear. So the boy's like, oh, I guess the game's over. And he goes to sleep. In the morning, the king returns. He's like, well, how did it go last night? And the boy's like, I had a great time, actually, playing nine pins. I lost a few pence, but I actually didn't shudder. And the king's like, I am literally astonished by you right now. And I don't understand this situation whatsoever because nobody's made it to the second night. And the boy's like, yeah, but did they learn to shudder, though? Because I haven't. And the king's like, okay, well, I will come back tomorrow. Hopefully you'll still be alive you strange, handsome, beautiful boy. And so he leaves and the boy sits down at the bench and he goes, oh, woe is me. If only I could learn to shudder. And he does that for the rest of the day. So nightfall, <laughs> midnight, a bunch of men, six in particular, come in carrying a coffin. And the boy looks at it and immediately goes, this must be my little cousin who passed a few weeks prior. So he calls out to the men and he says, come, bring my cousin here. So the men bring the coffin over. That No questions on either side, apparently. And when he opens up the coffin, there's a man in it. It's, it's not his little cousin, guys. There's just a man. And he's like, oh. Let me feel his face. So he rubs his hands on this dead man's face and is like, you're so cold. That's unfortunate. Let me let me warm you up a bit. So he goes over to the fire. He warms his own hands, comes back, puts them on the cheeks of the dead man, rubs them a little bit, but still the dead man lays cold. So the boy lifts the dead man up from the coffin and 
sits him on the bench and then begins to rub on his arms like he can restart this dead man's circulation. And that also didn't work, surprisingly. So being a rational young man, uh, he puts the man into his bed, the jumping bed, and then lays beside him and decides that, you know, when people lie together, they can keep each other warm with the heat of their body. So that's what I'll do for you. And he lays there. And after a while, eventually the body does warm. This actually works. And the man begins to move again as if he's alive. And the boy says, now, my little cousin, what would have happened if I hadn't warmed you? Again, this isn't his freaking cousin. So the man says, well, now I'm going to strangle you. And the boy is, like, super taken aback. He's like, well, this is all the things I get after everything I've done for you? Uh, no, absolutely not. So he picks up the man, throws him into the coffin, slams the lid shut, and then beckons for the six men to come back and take his cousin away from him. And they do, without a single word. These men just show up, they come back, they take the coffin, they go. And after some time, the boy's like, well... That was disappointing. I'm getting tired. So he goes to go lay down, but a very large man, larger than any of the men who have shown up before him, suddenly appears. And this man has a distinct difference of not only being ugly, but being old, like super old, with a super long, like, would make Gandalf jealous type of beard. And... He looks at the boy sitting on the bed and he's like, you miserable boy, now you will learn to shudder for it is your time to die. And the boy looks at him and says, I think not. You'd actually have to catch me first. Um, but don't worry, he doesn't lead him on like a wild goose chase, as funny as that would be. Because the old man says, I will have you soon. And the young boy goes, gentle, gentle, good sir. I'm as strong as you, if not stronger. And the young man says, or the old man says, if you are in fact stronger, then come with me and prove yourself. So now it's a game. It's not the chasing game I was hoping for, but it's a game. So the young boy follows this old man <laughs> way across the castle till they get to the blacksmith's forge, which is apparently always been there. We never noticed it. The bed didn't go there. And in the blacksmith's forge, he picks up an axe and with a single blow, drives an anvil straight into the ground. And then he hands the boy the axe and says, do better. And the young boy goes, well, I certainly will. So he goes to the other anvil and the old man comes closer to get a good look and see how strong this young boy actually is with his long white beard just dangling down there. And the young boy looks at him he looks at the anvil. He lifts up the axe and with a swift move, splits the anvil in two, wedging the old man's beard right into the crack. And he goes, well, now you're proper stuck. So you're going to be the one to die. <laughs> and he goes around uh, the blacksmith's forge until he finds an iron bar and then proceeds to beat the ever living piss out of this old man. Um, until the old man starts to beg him to stop. He's like, please, anything, anything, if you will stop beating the life out of me. I'm already dead, but I want to die again. I will give you all the riches I have here if you stop beating me. So the boy thinks about this and he's like, okay deal and he pulls the axe out he lets the man go the old man laments the loss of his beautiful beard because half of it's still stuck in the anvil and takes him to the other side of the castle all the way down into the cellar and shows him three chests full of gold and he says one of these chests is for the poor one of these is for the king and one of these is for you my boy and the clock strikes 3 a.m and the spirit of the old man disappears and the boy is left all alone in the dark so you have to feel his way through the castle and to till he sees the light coming from his little makeshift bedroom, falls asleep by the fire. So on the morning of the third day, the king comes and he says, certainly now you must know what it is to shudder. And the boy says, no, no luck yet. I wish I knew what it was. Um, all that happened last night was that I met my dead cousin and he was rude and a bearded man gave me lots of money, but no one showed me how to shudder. And this baffles the king because he's like, what the actual fuck are you talking about? But he's like, okay, <laughs> all right. That was an amazing story. Um, gold, you say? Um, and since you managed to make it the third night, you've actually broken the curse upon this castle. I didn't tell you that that was the case going into this, but you've now broken the curse on this castle. We're free from the ghosts that haunt this place. Um, so you're free to marry my daughter. And the boy says, well, that's all well and good, but I don't know how to shudder. And the king's like, I'm 
just going to ignore it because you have a beautiful face. And I, I'm i just so relieved to be past all this. So the king gets the gold brought out of the castle. It's divided appropriately. And there's a grand wedding shortly after. And the young boy, who's now a young king, um, is absolutely besotted. He loves his beautiful wife. And they were really happy together. They actually got along really well. Um, but at any moment of free time or like downtime he had, he would just sit around and lament and whine. If only I could shudder. If only I knew how to shudder. Which at first was kind of cute. To his wife but then she was like this is really fucking annoying if you could just grow up maybe and let this go and he would just sit there and be like if I knew how to shudder and she's like I can't stand it anymore so it went from being annoying to enraging so she goes and she tells her chambermaid like my fool of a husband cannot get over the fact that he doesn't know how to shudder and the chambermaid's like is that all Leave it to me. I'll help you make him shudder. So like a boss, she gets a pail. She goes down into the garden. She stops at the stream there, fills it up with the water from the stream and all the little minnows that swim in it. And she gives it to the queen and she tells her, wait until nightfall. And then your king will learn to shudder. So the queen waits until the boy king falls asleep. She pours the bucket of water over him. All the fish are like squiggling and wriggling and writhing on him. He wakes up with a great shudder and he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Finally, I know what it is to shudder. And the queen gave her husband the longest, longest stare anyone has ever given their husband. And it was just like, great. And she tipped the chambermaid handsomely for her never having to listen to her husband complain about not knowing how to shudder ever again. And that's the end of the story. So, <laughs> you guys, I absolutely love this story. I think it's bonkers. I love the boy. I think it's amazing. Um, I love that he's just so, like, non plussed by everything that comes his way. And he just treats dead men as equally as if they were living people. Um... I should add that this is actually a tale from the Grimm's brothers that they brought to their book in the first installment in 1812. And then they extended this in the version that they put out in 1819. But I actually read this story first in Andrew Lang's Blue Fairy book. It's the same story in both uh, books. So the versions didn't change that much. But I just thought, like, this is the funniest story um, to me. It's, like, one of those things where, like, it's supposed to be really scary, but it's just undercut by the fact that this boy is so, like, stupid. <laughs> but, and, like, I also feel really bad about it because everyone's like, God, you're an idiot. Uh, even the king is like, what a stupid kid. But I feel like the king is, like, a little bit low-key in love with him because he's like, God, what a handsome young man you are you're probably the prettiest guy who's ever come around to like do this and he's probably just relieved that his daughter didn't get married off to some uggo who managed to do it so he's just like whatever i don't care how stupid you are you did this <laughs> You did the thing. And I don't know. I just thought it was a really great story. And I'm really excited to be able to share it with you guys. I hope that you enjoyed it. Let me know what you thought of our hero in the comments below. Do you think he's secretly related to Jack and his wife, the maid? Because I kind of feel like this is a descendant. It has to be. Or like a secret love child. I don't know. I'm adding it to my in-universe canon. Um... Because it has to be a relative of some kind. Um, yeah, let me know. And if you have any requests for stories you want to hear on this chat, this segment, also my channel, uh, you can leave them in the comments below. Um, if you made it to the end of the video, I appreciate your face. And I will catch you guys all in the next one. Till then, happy crafting. Bye.